I'm glad you can all hear me today. So I'm very happy to welcome you to this year's Regulation for Innovation Conference. And indeed, I'm glad to see a full house because we have prepared an excellent line of speakers for you. Um, without any further ado, many of you know me for my punctuality, not today. So I suggest uh, we kick off and I wanted to a couple of views first from my side because I believe tech has changed the world but AI, the topic of today, has the potential to revolutionize it. Ten years ago, we had barely scratched the surface of what was possible in tech and what regulation may be required. Maximizing the positive outcomes of tech and reducing the potential pitfalls always looms large in the midst of politicians. And I'm grateful to see so many colleagues here uh, among us today. But this is particularly true, I believe, when it comes to AI, because it is a fundamentally different technology. It's, in a way, a unique technology, and it promises to transform all realms of human experience. We believe that AI will alter the human-machine relationship and our relationship with reason and reality. And so this is why I think we need to find a way for AI to co complement our human skills and way of life and not to be able to compromise our social contract. The global conversation on AI has been going on for some time, but the European Union has been the first to decide to put pen to paper. And as we shape our regulatory future here in Europe, I think it's clear we cannot talk tech without talking geopolitics. Just as we cannot ignore the power struggle between democracies and autocracies. Some of you know that I am one of the rapporteurs on the EU AI Act here in the European Parliament. And I very much believe and stand for open, global and accountable internet. But we also have to face the reality that autocracies don't share the same belief. I trust that we are going to come forward with a regulatory framework that reflects and protects our own values and norms. However, we can only have AI that is based on European values if companies are able to develop, to innovate, to deploy AI here in Europe rather than doing it somewhere else. Regulation for innovation is dear serious annual conferences to my, to, of mine because if we stifle European companies with red tape, we risk undermining the legitimacy and relevance of our own legislation. This does not mean relaxing the rules at the cost of fundamental rights and privacy, but honestly, on the contrary, it's about balancing and it's about being able to truly grasp and see the bigger picture. It requires looking beyond our borders and towards the regulatory approaches of other countries. We are known for our digital regulation and for the Brussels effect that comes with it, but this cannot lead to some sort of a regulatory isolation. And so this is a project, I believe, for the entire democratic world to come on board. And this is why this year's conference focuses particularly on AI and its geopolitical implications. We all know that war in Ukraine initiated by Russia and the threat of China has properly laid bare the vulnerabilities Europe has. And if the West loses the race to gain the economic, security, and social benefits of AI and other advanced technologies, there will be an era defining shift in global power. So we cannot afford to become a digital fortress of regulation. We must become a global tech leader, but also a partner to work with, not a regulatory giant to admire from afar. So this is why I very much look forward to today's discussion. And again, I want to thank the esteemed guests and all of you here today 
for the insights and hopefully for an interesting discussion uh, which we will uh, put uh, together. And now it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome perhaps for the first time in the European Parliament uh, in uh, Brussels, the world chess champion, uh, Gary Kasparov. Uh, Mr. Kasparov, please join me here uh, on the podium. Briefly, before I, I give you the word, I have to remind that uh, we all remember your famous match <laughs> with the IBM supercomputer Deep Blue in 1996, 1997, uh, bringing artificial intelligence chess uh, into truly the, the mainstream. Uh, and are also, this is part of the focus on, on you know, your latest uh, book. But in the same time, you have a leading role as a pro-democracy activist, as a fierce defender of Ukraine's sovereignty in the face of the Russian uh, aggressor. Um, and I would like to ask you to begin with a little bit more broader uh, look at the war in Ukraine. There are indeed many aspects on which we could speak uh, when it comes to uh, the grave human rights abuses, when it comes to the horrific war crimes, and so on and so forth, just witnessing what happened uh, yesterday in Kremenchuk. So I was wondering, how do you see Europe? How do you see whether did we learn, you know, what did we learn from this ongoing confrontation? Did we manage very quickly to extract some lessons? And how does technology in general feature in today's conflict of democracy versus authoritarianism? Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me here today. My thanks to MEP. I admire Dale for her leadership on the vital issues of rights and security in the digital era. And as the first knowledge uh, worker to have his job threatened by a machine, I'm very invested in the topic. But today, we are faced with a crisis of life and death, not the virtual world. We are confronted by violence we hoped was in the distant past. As increasingly critical, as cybersecurity is, today in Europe there is a dire need for firepower, not firewalls. The completely unprovoked new invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin on February 24th has taught the EU and the world many lessons it refused to learn until it was too late. When Putin first invaded Ukraine in 2014, I warned that he would not stop there. Unfortunately, few were listening. Today, you are, but Ukraine is paying a very high price in blood for others to learn the lesson that dictators do not stop until they are stopped. The blood is on Putin's hands first and foremost, of course. It is also stain on the conscience of every nation and leader that failed to act since 2014. But it brings me no satisfaction to say, I told you so. Past tragedies cannot be prevented. What is far more important is that you will listen and act now to prevent the next tragedy by learning how we got here with Russian missiles raining down on European civilians as I speak. The main lesson is do not wait. Act boldly to isolate and contain dictators. Do not wait for them to act and then react. Europe and the United States have consistently been slow, been behind Putin, responding proportionally in ways he is prepared for. This measured approach may be appropriate in trade disputes with other democracies, but it's a recipe for disaster with a hostile dictatorship that cares nothing for its people. Act decisively, quickly, or Putin will ignore you. 
Dictators don't care about next year or even next month, as long as they are in power tomorrow. You are defending lives and your way of life. This is war. Act like it. Act with urgency. Advanced technology, like artificial intelligence, makes it even more important to act quickly, to stay in the lead, to be on the cutting edge. I'm sure you know that Europe is far behind the U.S. and Asia in these fields. And this is not merely an academic or commercial crisis for Europe, but a security crisis. Security crisis, too. Europe should not become completely dependent on American or, God forbid, Chinese technology for digital and information security. As Europe falls further behind, it will attempt to regulate its way to security, playing defense only. This creates a downward cycle of less innovation and more regulations. Instead, Europe must bring its values to the technological cutting edge. Basic research, public and private sponsorship, it must be built, built in from the ground up. It must compete aggressively. You cannot take American tech and companies or Chinese and cover them with European regulatory paint. The battle between democracy and dictatorship is being fought right now in war and cyber war. We need firepower and firewalls in both cases. The initial advantage in these cases is with the attacker. The expected wave of Russian cyber attacks has not materialized because Ukraine and the rest of the world stopped playing defense and has taken the attack to Russia. Similarly, Russia's military attacks will decrease when Putin's war machine is on the run. The best defense is a good defense. It's not only true in chess. Yes, I used to be something of a chess player. Some of you might recall. I was often told that politics were not like chess, that things were not black and white. But some things are. There is good, there is evil. There is freedom, there is tyranny. Do not look at the Russian missile hitting a Ukrainian shopping mall yesterday and tell me there is no black and white. We must take a side. We must fight. And we must win. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as you're the person kind of setting the scene on the topic, perhaps I'll allow myself two brief questions before we move to our second distinguished speaker and later on um, to, to the panel. First of all, thank you for reminding us about the multiple crises we find ourselves in, and especially the security one, both from a the perspective of the war in Ukraine, but also from a technological perspective. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a funny anecdote. When, when we were discussing how we set up the, the conference, one of my team members, I said, look, I, I very much want to invite uh, Gary Kasparov. I think it's a great idea. And one of my team members said, why would you do that? He was defeated uh, by uh, the blue. So why would he want to defend your cause? And I said, so first of all, you don't remember correctly, because Gary Kasparov was the first one to defeat the blue. But then, you know, my team member seems to be also the person that remembers that you got defeated the second time. And then I said, he said something very interesting, that it was not the triumph of the machine. It was the triumph of the engineers behind the machine. So I'm wondering, where do you stand today? Are you a tech? optimist, tech realist, um, and are you, you know, how do you see the future of AI development and deployment? I kind of, you know, one of the conversations we just had earlier, um, I kind of feel we, we focus too much about what happened yesterday when we talk about AI and focus less on the development and deployment. So your views uh, in that respect will be much appreciated. It will be a very long story. Um, um... Going back to 1997, uh, the match uh, that stays in history as, as, as a dawn of artificial intelligence. So I, you know, I believe these days that it was, a, it was a blessing, not a curse. That's what I thought 25 years ago. Um, because I was part of history, and, um, and I think, you know, I, I was a, one of the first, if not the first one, who faced the inevitable. There are certain areas where machines would dominate, and there's nothing wrong about it. 
You ask me whether I'm you know, an optimist or realist, uh, uh, definitely not a pessimist, as you can guess. So I, uh, I believe my task is to fight the army of doomsayers that are trying to capitalize on the Hollywood brainwashing production and telling us that the, the end is near, that we all will be swamped by the all-powerful machines that will, you know, will dictate us how to live or even will exterminate us. Never understood why Skynet wanted to exterminate humanity. So that's, that was one of the big questions when I was a Terminator. Um, now, um, you know, uh, AI is still a product of, of humans. And uh, it is not a magic wand, but it is not a Terminator. It is not a harbinger of utopia or dystopia. You know, it's not a, a path to heaven, but it doesn't open the gates of hell. It's a tool, and it's for us to use it. So what's, uh, what's the pr principal difference between technologies that help us to become stronger? Or this technology should, become us, should help us becoming smarter. Oh, yeah, of course, you know, it's, it's somehow it challenges the, our belief that we are unique because we can think. Look, machines do not think the way we do. So, and uh, I, since we, we have very limited time, maybe there will be more opportunities later on during this conference to actually express my, my just, or ideas, just, just, just to give you a deeper explanation. But uh, machines will not be able to um, copy or just even somehow replicate human creativity. And for a very simple reason, you know, creativity and intuition, they're based on, on ambiguity because you don't know the final outcome. You can be successful, you can fail. Machines do not operate in this, with, with this kind of algorithm. It's all about, you know, the highest return. So um, I uh, think that, you know, it's, it's the, our task is to understand so how we, you know, uh, how we uh, find the best position for humans in human-machine collaboration. Since 1997, I have been advocating for human-machine collaboration, believing this is the way into the future. And uh, my concern is not uh, evil machines. My concern is still with humans. Humans still have monopoly for evil. It's not about the Terminator, you know, deciding that, you know, to go crazy and just killing all of us. It's about dictators that will use, ironically, technology invented in the free world to undermine our way of life. So that's why, again, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, we'll definitely cover some of these topics in, 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 in a conversation here uh, later. But I, I think, again, it's, it's, um, it's, it, should not be, it should not be taken as a threat, but as an opportunity. But every opportunity, you know, could be used for good and bad. So, and unfortunately, destruction is always comes before creation. Thank you. Just last very brief question, and indeed, you'll be part of the panel later on, so we'll, we'll be able to go more um, in depth. But um, as you said, history teaches key technologies can be uh, decisive at times. And, and looking at, uh, you know, uh, as this war unfortunately in, intensifies, our vulnerabilities are, are laid bare. Um, what steps do you think we can take uh, as Europeans together with the rest of our democratic partners to help secure this common future um, looking, looking ahead? Okay. Again, I think we're talking about human problems, not machines problems. It's not about technology. What the free world is lacking now is leadership. Is it a secret for you? <laughs> we have a bunch of managers running our affairs. People are afraid to make historic decisions. And now we are at a time where decisions to be made. Because every decision made is now will decide the, the future of uh, free world and humanity for years, probably for decades. This is one of the turning points of history. And tragically, we don't have great leaders of the past to show us the way. So that's a problem. It's the, it's, you know, when people talked about the logistical challenges that we're facing now, just, you know, in this war, I always remind them that in the first six months of Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union, 1941, America trans transported to, to, the US, to, to the USSR 360,000 tons of, uh, of uh, um, uh, weapons and ammunition. 360,000 tons while the entire Europe was controlled by, by Nazis and they had to go through the Arctic, you know, facing German submarines and Luftwaffe. Is it that difficult now? Are we missing, what, logistics or political will? So I think the answer is absolutely obvious. It's the, uh, and again, it's at every turning point in history you now, it's about, uh, 
uh, the, the, the uh, strengths of our leaders and also the public, public recognition that what's happening is, is important for all of us to be involved. And uh, we're not, yeah, we're in crisis now, but again, compared to 1940, just, you know, look at the, at the, at the moments in history that that's, uh, now many believed were just, you know, the end of, the end of time. 1940, Stalin was still Hitler ally in Europe. So, and, uh, and uh, Britain stood alone against, against Nazi war machine. America was still, you know, contemplating its next, its, its next move. Today, the free world has a decisive economic and military advantage over unfree world. Let me emphasize, decisive. But uh, again, we are complacent. We still think that, you know, we, we can negotiate our way through. I'm in favor of negotiation, of consensus, of diplomacy, but it doesn't work all the way. And Putin is teaching us this lesson. And I hate thinking that Ukrainians are paying in blood, as we speak, for our unwillingness to recognize this fact. Thank you very much. That was a, a very clear message. Uh, some of us uh, try to amplify the message of leadership often across uh, this house, but we hope to see more decisive actions indeed. Um, you're very welcome to stay here on the podium, uh, join uh, the fellow panelists and later come back again as you feel comfortable, but we'll move to our uh, second guest you now. Know, you're in charge, so yes, I probably move on just, you know, not to... Not to confuse the second guest. <laughs> um, so it is my, my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Uh, Eric Schmidt, who I see uh, is connected uh, and uh, with us. Uh, Dr. Schmidt has served as Google Chief Executive Officer and Chairman uh, for almost uh, 10 uh, years, as well as Executive Chairman and Technical Advisor. Uh, Dr. Schmidt was the chair of the U.S. National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, and his most recent initiative, the Special Competitiveness Studies Project, was found in October 2021, which is a bipartisan nonprofit initiative with a very clear mission to make recommendations to strengthen America's long-term competitiveness for a future where artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies reshape our national security, economy, and society. Uh, last, with Dr. Schmidt, we shared a discussion at the Munich Security uh, Conference on the topic, and I'm very glad he accepted our invitation to join us uh, today and continue the discussion. I see we have friends from the Munich Security Conference also joining us uh, today, among uh, others. Uh, so, uh, Eric, thank you for being with us uh, today, and you have the floor for opening remarks. We will just need to make sure that the technicians can enlarge the screen and we can have the volume in the room, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, shall we'll I just begin? Need Yes, please, you can begin. We just need the, 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 the picture being enlarged, but that will happen, I'm told. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so first place, thank you for inviting me. I'm in Aspen where we're at a conference talking about similar things. Uh, I think the important thing to say to everybody here is that the technology revolution is proceeding apace even while we're dealing with these traditional issues and these hor horrible issues involving Ukraine and so forth and so on. And we need to stay focused on the implications of that. Uh, the most important thing from my perspective is competition with China. And the reason is that China has a priority to win in AI, quantum, synthetic biology, new energy, and a number of other deep tech areas. And they are putting enormous amounts of money behind them. They are building the businesses of the future. And I can say to everyone in the room, you don't want to be the customer of the platforms that they're going to build because those platforms reflect a set of values and the way you operate that are counter to the way Europeans and the West and democracies work. In particular, the issues of control, surveillance, censorship, and so forth 
are fundamental violations of European and American values, which we, of course, inherited from you all. So it's important to understand that we have to be on a footing to win. Um, I've spent the last few years working with my colleagues here in the United States to establish a set of doctrines around that, which we can talk about with people who are interested in it. The most important thing to say is that Europe is behind. And Europe is behind, and I just want to be blunt, because it's better just to be blunt, and Americans are blunt anyway. Um, Europeans start with regulation, not with innovation. And it, there's a serious danger that the extraordinary technical capabilities that are present in Europe and very, very sophisticated science and innovation is going to be beaten out, first by the U.S., but more importantly from China, who are a volume manufacturer. So uh, I'm committed to making sure that Western values, the way we operate, um, the way democracies work, the freedom that we all represent are represented in our technology. I'm focused on semiconductors. I'm focused on synthetic biology, which is a huge industry that Europe should be a big leader in. And of course, artificial intelligence. Much of the technology has been invented in Europe, but it's being pursued elsewhere. So Eva, maybe it's better if rather than me talking, you ask questions or the audience ask questions. Thank you very much uh, for this, again, very clear opening uh, remarks. Um, indeed, maybe I have uh, one or two questions and then I'll open it up uh, to, to, to the audience uh, because, uh, as you've probably heard, we, we like to say that, you know, we are – you know, we are the first to put regulation on the table, so we are the ones that the rest should should follow. Um, but uh, I have to say that the U.S. has recently made some advancements and advances in AI regulation, uh, particularly with the establishment of the National Security Commission on Artificial um, Intelligence, which you've chaired. Um, and so we have seen that there's been the introduction of the Algorithmic Accountability Act, for example, um, and, of course, not to mention the countless uh, other initiative to regulate new technologies through the Federal Trade Commission or, or other bodies. Um, so I, I think it will be very interesting for everyone here in the room to hear a little bit more about the work of the Commission on AI um, and also just your views on how do you see regulation of AI and new technologies developing in the U.S. for the years to come. Uh, I'm familiar with the report uh, that was produced, um, and it has a very different uh, approach compared to the European approach, but maybe you could tell us a little bit more on, on that. And again, with apologies for being blunt and obnoxious, starting with regulation is exactly the wrong thing, right? Starting with innovation followed by regulation is exactly the right thing. So even, if I may, the way you describe this, you describe this as a regulatory process. Congress asked a group of people, including myself, to work on how do we win in national security and artificial intelligence. There's a great concern that we're critically dependent for our security, all of us, the Europe, you guys, me, everybody, on these platforms that we're going to fall behind. That was the concern. What do we do? And our, rec our recommendations were not primarily regulatory. They were about science and investment and partnerships with European firms and getting our strategies correct and so forth. There is no analog in Europe coming for us to work with, although people are talking about it. The part of what I wanted to say to you all is that in order to have a seat at the table, you've got to be part of the creating an innovation engine. And I know that Europeans are capable of doing this. This is a priority and public policy question for Europe. In the case of America, our recommendations were to build common uh, development frameworks, to additional research, as I, as I mentioned, building a democratic coalition around technology so that democratic countries were all coordinating and understanding and making sure that we collectively work to build the next generation of platforms. The power of AI is so great in a good sense that we need to be the business leaders and the innovators along our values. That's sort of my basic pitch. 
Thank you for uh, clarifying uh, that. Um, maybe you've mentioned China and the competition with China. Uh, it's a topic that we don't spend too much time discussing here uh, in Brussels. Uh, and I personally view, view the topic from a national security perspective. Uh, but as we're witnessing the war in Ukraine, I mean, China is looming in the background. Um, we should, you know, I think avoid underestimating China and making the same mistake in, in a different arena that we made uh, with Russia. Um, so what do you make of the strategic competition with China? Um, and is there hope for a meaningful shared strategy on, on China between uh, democratic allies? Um, well, first place, I would ideally like an agreement between China and the West to mutually grow the economy of the world globalization, all the benefits that we get of shared understanding, shared technology, we're not doing that. Instead, what's happening is we're becoming more and more isolated. And by the way, it's not necessarily driven by the West. China does not want those pesky ideas around free expression and freedom and so forth. And they block all that content and they're getting better and better at blocking it. So it's not like they want to partner with us and we don't. So we have to frame this correctly. Imagine a scenario where all the batteries, which are all made in China, have a protocol, and that protocol allows them to communicate in a way that's encrypted that we can't control, and the batteries are all of a sudden in some kind of network control. There are all sorts of bad scenarios that are possible if we become critically dependent on only one country that, we're, that doesn't reflect our values. So what I would suggest is that we are underestimating China. We treat them as though they're the poor developing country. It's no longer true. They have four times as many uh, STEM graduates in, in uh, essentially engineering. And even if you assume their GDP productivity is half that of Europe, they have four times as many people as the United States. So they would be roughly twice the GDP of the United States. This is a major competitive issue. And they are not encumbered by all of these laws, regulations, and concerns that you hear from Europe. They actually don't care. And furthermore, they violate almost every European privacy principle. So we've got to find a way. So my recommendation, jumping to a specific recommendation, is that Brussels do a innovation and regulation panel, as opposed to just regulation, where the question is, how does Europe, using all the incredible resources Europe have, become a, a global player in these technologies. I'll give you some examples. Um, the UK, which I guess is no longer part of Europe, is where DeepMind was invented. It's one of the two or three places where real uh, general intelligence is being uh, happening. The second is if you look at things like ASML, it's a Dutch company that's incredibly strategic. It's essentially a monopoly on the fastest, fastest chips. That shows you what Europe can do. I think the same is possible in Europe around synthetic biology. Europe has fantastic, fantastic biology labs. And the application of AI to that is, again, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of jobs to be created in Europe. That's the position, in my view, that Brussels should take, as opposed to a regulatory one alone, which does not reflect the fact that you're going to get beaten by the people who are not regulated. Thank you very much. I'm looking for a show of hands if anyone uh, wants to take the floor uh, for a brief question. Uh, the gentleman over there uh, in the back. I'll collect two questions or so, then my colleague, Henna. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Juha Heikila. I'm advisor for artificial intelligence at the European Commission, and I'm focusing mainly on international matters. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, firstly, um, we have actually started innovation before regulation, um, have funded uh, research and innovation in this area in robotics, in intelligent robotics, uh, for quite a number of years. In fact, we had the biggest civilian pro program in robotics uh, uh, some years ago, and we have increased our investment. Um, so... Um, the focus these days is very much on regulation, but there is more to it. And the European Commission is also a funding agency, not just a regulatory agency. And we have uh, plans to increase our investment in this area also in basic technologies. 
And some of this, of course, then fuels the talent and the excellence which uh, is in many of the AI research labs also run by many American companies. So uh, uh, we have also coordinated the action with the member states. So in, in, um, in addition to increasing the investment on our side at the EU level, we have encouraged the member states and uh, given them um, urge them to, to increase their investment and coordinate their AI approach uh, with ours. So that's actually quite an important factor which sometimes uh, gets forgotten. So, and I fully agree with the statement that the like-minded and, and, and nations and regions which share the values should work together and cooperate. Uh, and this is something that uh, we are doing we have started recently the Trade and Technology Council with the U.S., which I'm sure you are, most of you are aware of in this audience, and that is actually a way to, to, to deal with this and to address the uh, challenges that we face, starting from the common value base. And as regards regulation, then, um, it is actually quite important for us that we strike the right balance between innovation and regulation. That is certainly our concern mission. And, of course, one of the key drivers of this is to prevent fragmentation. We have 27 member states, um, so we wanted to avoid a situation where the single market doesn't work anymore and where we have a fragmented landscape. Um, I think on the U.S. side there is a similar challenge because some of the states um, have started to regulate, um, the state of Maine, for example, on biometric identification. And uh, I, I can see that there could be a risk of fragmentation on the U.S. side, at least on our side, there is now a way forward, uh, can be criticized, and it has been criticized, uh, but uh, this fragmentation, we think, is a real issue which could actually then hamper innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, do you want to respond directly? It's, it's, yes? yes, I'd like to okay. respond directly. So first, I want to thank you for driving this in, in Brussels. You are, in my view, the savior of this issue. And my feedback would be everything you said is correct and you're off by a factor of 10, right? And the reason I say that is that the key innovations in AI are not, for example, biometric, because biometric is not that interesting. Key innovations, for example, are in large language models, uh, new forms of analytics, new algorithms and things like this, where that leadership is occurring outside of Europe. Uh, you need to do a lot more than you just described and you need to do it soon. Another example is that the draft regulation that you all offered a couple of years ago had a definition a year and a half ago, had a definition of critical facilities where at least the draft version said the following. You cannot use AI in critical situations unless it can explain itself. And that is a trap because AI today, the technology cannot explain itself satisfactorily. You have to work with it and understand its failures and strengths. That is a chilling effect on innovation because of the nature of it started with regulation as opposed to innovation. I think the third comment about the U.S. is it's easy to cherry pick things in the U.S. and the U.S. is always a mess. But I can assure you that the U.S., there's so much investment in these core AI platforms that are at a national level that we would like to par partner with the Europeans on in many, many ways that I do not worry one second about fractionalization. Your issue around the 27 uh, countries is real. What I would prefer, and again, this is my bias, and I love Europe, is why don't you let the countries innovate, try and figure out where the clusters of this extraordinary talent is. And God knows, they may be in little itty-bitty countries or they may be in the big ones. Uh, and the important thing is let them bloom. The effect of what you're, what you're saying at the European level is Europe is lagging. And somebody's got to say it. I'm going to say it directly. I want that to, fit, to change. I'm willing to spend time in Europe. I'm, I'm willing to work on this. I think we need Europe to be a great leader, and I think Europe can pull it off. Thank you. And you will hear now from my colleague from Finland, Hanna Björkjöne. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Schmidt, for your, your presentation. And I very much uh, share the view with you. I'm a member of European Parliament uh, from Finland, like ever my colleague uh, said that uh, we, we should be very careful that we are not over-regulating -reg our digital markets here, and we know that Europe is very good at regulation, and I, I agree very much that we, we should 
uh, innovations and fundamental research and uh, uh, not set obstacles for the innovations and investments in, in this field. But at the same time, I think it's important for businesses also to have some legal certainty that they know also maybe what kind of anyway rules there will be when they are making investments that they are not taking too much risks also to some technologies which are not maybe um, uh, possible in, in the future. But I'd like to know also more about uh, how you see uh, the need for that kind of like a global rules in AI. Or like you said, that it's important that Europe and the USA are cooperating together, but is it enough, that kind of cooperation we are having? Or should, should we have to try to have something more, more binding in glo global level? Under UNESCO, we have now global rules or framework for AI, but of course it's on a very general level because also uh, China is committed to those, those rules or those, this framework. But how do you see how we could work more closely together or is there a need for some kind of global framework or rules in AI? So again, you're, you're starting with the premise that, that there's value in such global framework at the regulatory level. Um, I think it's very clear that there should be AI ethics policies. And by ethics, I'm referring to the values of the country, or in this case, in Brussels. And I've worked, and a number of people have worked on ethics statements, what's appropriate and what's not. I'll give you my favorite example, which is that you don't fundamentally globally want to have automatic weapons systems. You don't want to have systems that will on their own make decisions about war and kinetic activity. That's just very, very dangerous. So that's an example where we might be able to get some agreement. But first, I don't think you're going to get an agreement on uh, even things like GDPR uh, regulations at a global level. There are just differences in culture. I spent 20 years dealing with the differences around the world, and these are cultural differences around speech and privacy uh, and the power of the state. You're not going to find agreement there. My advice would be try to get the, the ethics agreements. What are the ethics? What are the principles written down? Instead, you write them down as regulations. Write down the principles, and that will allow the entrepreneurs and the investment to be guided by those principles. And I think that makes sense to me. We can find agreement across those principles between all of the democratic countries. Thank you very much. I'm looking for anyone else who wants to take the floor. The lady in the back over there, please. Please Thank be you. brief and maybe we can take and squeeze in one more question then. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Miriam Weigand. Um, I'm a trainee for the Transatlantic Relations for the EPP group. And um, the previous speaker um, already talked about that we cannot talk about tech without talking about geopolitics. And we saw in the Russian war of aggression um, that Starlink um, sent satellites and um, gave equipment to Ukraine, and that made a decisive impact in Ukraine on like how technology and like how communications are going to be um, well um, kept alive during the war. And I was wondering specifically how AI is also going to impact geopolitics. In a sense, I guess, because it's much more vast than satellite-based internet connections. Um, yeah. I think the Starlink example is a very good example of the principles of the internet. Remember that in the 1960s, the DARPA grant for the internet was to build a communication system that was resistant to failure. And one of the unsung stories in Ukraine is the tech companies working with European governments kept the internet up. And as a military goal from Russia, I'm sure they had a goal to take it down. And that Internet allowed uh, people to identify where the opponents were, identify where the targets were, and get others to go. It's a networked war. So one principle is that all future wars, all future conflicts will be networked and decentralized. They'll have different kinds of failure points. And I worked for the Defense Department for five years. So I spent a lot of time on this. And I think with respect to AI, the core questions about AI will be what advantage does it give you in terms of speed? So in military, the conflicts are happening faster and faster, 
And it sure looks to me like the kind of conflicts in the future will be faster than human decision making. So we have a real conundrum that we want humans making the decisions about war, but the decisions are faster than humans can make those decisions. And we don't want the computer making the decision. We want the humans to make the decision. So as AI makes things faster and you say, how does it make faster? Everything happens faster. Hypersonics happen faster. Targets happen faster. Cyber war happens faster. And in many cases, these decisions will be faster than the traditional military speed hierarchy. This is a core hard problem that we all need to spend some time on. Thank you. Um, last question, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Nima Harry. Thank you very much, first off, for organizing this uh, conference and for Mr. Kasparov and Mr. Schmidt. My, uh, my question is pretty simple. Uh, it's regarding when we're talking about regulation in the states, the regulation in terms of copyright and patents is pretty strong. So uh, if, if innovation is important, if creativity is important, what should be the role of patents and uh, copyright? Should that also be removed as well in terms of regulation? Um, I okay. don't think that's necessary. I think if you look at the rate of innovation, the patent system and the copyright system has generally contributed to the ability for business to invest over the long run. So I think the average American strategist, technologist, and so forth is not making that argument. I think we can achieve our argument by simply running ahead. My primary concern, and I just, I just say it directly, Everyone has seen all the Terminator movies, and everyone is concerned that somehow the AI scientists are building killer robots, and those killer robots are going to be unleashed on society. This is from a movie. There's plenty of things that are to worry about, but that's not one of them. We don't know how to build killer robots today if we did. What we're doing is we're building systems that will be integrated with humans. And in the same sense that social media is driving everyone crazy because it's changed the conversation, changed the politics, this next generation of AI systems is going to have an enormous impact on the body politic, how people communicate, how they think, how they perceive the truth, and so forth. Those are issues that are well worth a joint conversation among psychologists, economists, philosophers, and computer people, as well as the governments. But we need to come to a consensus about, first, how do we win that fight? And second, how do we make sure we're going to be happy with what we have, what we have built? That's the priority. And I think you guys, as a group, could really make a difference here. And thank you very much for letting me come. Thank you very much for joining us. As always, a very direct and blunt, but this is exactly what we need today. I think Europe and the democratic world has no time to waste when it comes to the development of technologies. So thanks for sharing your thoughts, uh, and I hope this is not the last time we see you uh, in Brussels in the next couple of months. I look forward to visiting. Thank you very much. And now I am very happy uh, to give the moderating chair to Peter Chase. Um, it's kind of the hot chair here, uh, Peter. Uh, so uh, I'm very glad that uh, you will be introducing the panel and we'll be going even an, in a further uh, and in-depth discussion about Europe uh, competitiveness. You should do that, yes, please, Peter. So good, af good afternoon, my name is Peter Chase. I'm a senior fellow with the German Marshall Fund based here in Brussels and am delighted to have this opportunity to work with um, Ms. Smidel in looking at how the EU is regulating AI and how it affects them and how it affects how you look at something like that in this broad, not just transatlantic context, but a global context. And I think we've We've talked about a number of these things. I thought that the beginning with Mr. Kasparov and Mr. Schmidt 
could not have been better in terms of laying out the sorts of issues that we have. Um, in running this, I'd actually like to run it quickly. Um, you all have bios. I'm not going to tell people's bios, but there will be, of course, references to what they're doing and how they, how they work, and they'll, they'll bring in their own things as well. But I'd like to move quickly, and I also do want you to participate. So please do think of the questions that you would ask, the questions that you would ask, in order to try to bring out uh, some of the issues that have come up when we look at regulating AI. Mr. Kasparov, I'd like to start with you. Yeah. So I found it really interesting that Mr. Schmidt started by talking about China and the challenge of China. And then he said something in referring to Europe that actually is a Chinese expression. He said, let the flowers bloom. 100 flowers bloom is a very, the people who know Chinese history will, will know that one from the Communist Party, from, from a period when the Chinese Communist Party felt that it needed creativity to actually advance their country and their economy. You have written about machine intelligence and creativity. So here's your question. Can a totalitarian society be creative enough to apply artificial intelligence to develop the software for artificial intelligence tools in a way that outcompetes us? Thank you very much for um, giving me this order to start this, this, this debate. It's, um, if I'm not uh, wrong, it's a uh, it's quote from Chairman Mao's book. Mm -hmm. That's 100 Fowls Bloom, yes. Uh, because I grew up in the Soviet Union. So we, <laughs> we used to do, we just know, know these things. Now, um, yeah, it's, it's a very important question, and it's, you know, it's not about tech, but it's also about philosophy. It's about you know, free people versus unfree people. And uh, while I, I, I have no doubt about uh, uh, numbers presented by Mr. Schmidt about investment in China and, and efforts of Chinese Communist government to, to uh, take a lead uh, in this competition, look, I think there are certain practical results that could tell us that no investments and no technology can actually help unfree people to beat free world. China gave us virus. Free world gave us a vaccine. Period. That's it. That's all we have to know about the future. And they had, what, six months lead? You know, they, were, they had a jump start because they had all the data, which, by the way, they were hiding from us. And they failed. It's a most miserably failed. They couldn't accept that Sinovac was a joke compared to vaccines that invented the free world. And they just, you know, they did a lockdown, you know, keeping tens of millions of people, you know, locked in, the, in, in their apartments. Look, it's just, for me, it's, it's, it's one of the best demonstrations that, you know, the, the, the reason why the people in the unfree world will never beat uh, the free minds is because the key component of success and creativity is, is lack of fear to fail. And uh, in countries like China, again, I grew up in the Soviet Union, it's not there because, yeah, they would like to have hundreds of startups, but they want to know exactly which one will be Google. So it's the, the fundamental flaws of central planning and total control of the Communist Party or whatever ideology is there that puts certain constraints on, on creativity of even those, the, the greatest graduates that come from America back, back to China. So that's, that's my answer. I could go on and on, but I'm sure others will have more to add. Great. Thank you very much. Now, we are joined in part by Mr. Nigel Toon, who is the CEO of GraphCore. It's, it's a European firm, no longer an EU firm. But, you know, GraphCore, a lot of the work that GraphCore has done has been under an EU regulatory regime. Mr. Toon, are you there? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you perfectly, and when, and when you start speaking, you'll be able to come, you'll be on screen as you are now. The, the question I'd like to ask of you, GraphCore does some really neat stuff, and you do a lot of stuff in terms of the hardware, the wafer on wafer chip te technology that you're developing, the speed that you are, are being able to develop in your AI chips and computers, but you also do the software. And when you hear people talking about regulating AI, as a person who is a, a leading company of AI, what does that mean to you? Are they regulating the hardware that you do? When you're talking about competitiveness, is it the competitiveness of the hardware or the competitiveness of the software? Is there a difference in terms of the creativity aspect in the hardware and software side? Which is more important, which should be regulated? 
Yeah, so um, the software really unlocks the hardware capability. The hardware allows new innovations to become possible, but those only are available if the software can provide access to those hardware platforms. Um, the regulation, I think, sits at a higher level, and I very much agree with what uh, Eric Schmidt was saying, that we really need to think about some higher level um, ethical directions rather than trying to be explicit. And, and the point I would make is if we go back to Aristotle, Aristotle said that there are two ways that we infer a decision. One is through a deductive process where we have all the information available and we work through a logical process to come up with the answer. Um, that is what you do with conventional software. Um, you have the information to hand, you write a program that represents a step-by-step -step process to uh, come up with a logical answer. In AI, what you're doing instead is the other side of what uh, Aristotle said. You are doing uh, induction. And induction implies you do not have all the information to hand. You are coming up with a probabilistic um, description. And, uh, and as a result, sometimes the answer will be wrong. And so we cannot necessarily make AI be fully knowable. We can understand how it works. We can understand the outcomes that it's striving to produce. But sometimes, just as humans do, it will get the answers wrong. And so as a result, the regulation really needs to go around the whole system and needs to be directional in terms of driving the objective functions that the AI system is trying to produce. So it's very much at the application layer, I would say, rather than at the hardware level or at the enabling software level, it is very much at the application level and what people do with the technology that is the most important piece in terms of thinking about how this application, this incredible technology is applied. I can follow up very quickly. I mean, again, you, you develop AI computers basically in the, the processing behind it um, and are doing very well in that respect. Can all, if, if you can, is there an area that uses computers today can't use your, your machines? So your, is your machine kind of uh, application neutral? So if you want to build competitiveness, it's in building the machines and what they can do, but the regulation would then apply to the, how the way the machine is used? Correct. So the, 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 the computer, the, the whole point of a computer is for it to be general purpose and to apply to many applications. The computer, the specific computer we're building is focused on AI applications. And, and so the, the regulation, to the extent there is regulation, is, is going to be applied at the application level. It is going to be applied to what people do. And I think this is a misunderstanding. You, you cannot tell the AI system what it can and cannot do. At a certain extent, you can. But you can't necessarily build regulation in there. It is really the method that is used to learn. It is the method that is used to apply the AI, which is driven by humans. That is where the application, that's where the regulation really needs to um, be placed. And so it's much more about human behavior rather than the behavior of the AI itself um, that you are looking to regulate. Because it's really AI is a human created tool. It is the humans that create it that need to be regulated and the applications that is put to that would need to be regulated. Thank you very much. I'm I'm not sure why I'm getting feedback here. Um, this, this one. All right. No, no. Anyway, um, Ms. Nadeau, Eva, I wanted to ask you, because you're the one who's now regulating AI. There's an AI act, right? And you're there, and you're trying to work with you and your colleagues are regulating artificial intelligence. Is the nuance recognition do you find in your discussions recognition of a difference between regulating the technology, the machine, where the input comes in and goes, is turned around and then there's an output? Is there a difference between regulating the technology, the machine, or the output? Is, is it important that you make a distinction between regulating the machine and the output when you're doing this, when you're looking at Europeans' competitiveness? 
Thank you very much uh, for, for this question. Well, you know, I think um, it starts from the point of how we actually see regulation uh, in, in Europe. And uh, when we speak about Europe's competitiveness, um, I would like us to, you know, see it in twofold. On one hand, on the economic competitiveness, and on the other hand, on the national security part. And this also has to be the way we put our glass and lenses when we decide what is the difference. Is it the output or is it the machine? My sense currently is that there is a taste for over regulating, meaning regulating both in a way. Um, and for me, it's very important to, to say that, you know, what we are trying to do um, also in our report is to make sure um, that on one hand, we have a flexible and adaptable uh, regulation, uh, which uh, helps us uh, to see the long-term view. And in this respect, whoever trains the machines and produces you know, what the outcome is, also has a responsibility of, you know, being accountable, not just the one that develops it, uh, because that's the, the one that is not training the machine afterwards and is unaware for what purposes um, the machine uh, will be uh, used. But I think for me, again, um, when we regulate, this is more into the details, but when we regulate, for me, we need to see the bigger picture and what truly is our aim, what we want to achieve. Is it just who's responsible or is it making sure that AI is trustworthy? You know, it, our values are applied in, in the whole, so to say, chain of the development. Um, and then we are not just better capable of being competitive, uh, but globally we set a standard that is acceptable for the Western democracies uh, and hence will be also more secure for the citizens. Uh, because what some of the other panelists said and mentioned, and, and I think this is very true, we sometimes, I think, are the ones, you know, coming up with the technology which is used by the autocrats against our values. So we don't want this to happen, and we need to find ways of how this should not happen. It's not going to happen actually through the AI Act, right? But it's part of the whole puzzle. So we need to be cautious not to hamper innovation while we develop this regulation and in the same time be able to, while going to the details, who's responsible, be able to see the big picture. And I think this is the issue that very often we, we have when we are, you know, part of our discussions are focused on the text, not on global issues. So was Mr. Schmidt right? in saying that Europe tends to regulate before it innovates? Or was, is the AI Act the way it's going now? Is it going in the right direction of setting a framework, which is a little bit more flexible? Or is it a little bit more, uh, is it going to create more, problem, more issues in the way people, and again, I want to try to distinguish between the technology and the use of the technology there are two different things. Here. Yeah. Well, um, he also said that we have some pretty good I I innovation as well, and I think we, we would all agree with that, but we will all agree that, um, you know, if you don't, I think you first have to see the bigger picture and understand where you want to get and why you want to get there, rather than saying, oh, we're not sure what to do with facial recognition, which, by the way, is 5% of the whole story of, of what we want to do with the AI Act, um, and there's 95% of the story, which is more broad, um, uh, of course. Um, and so I think if we don't see, you know, the bigger picture, um, it will be very difficult for us uh, to develop both. You can't probably develop them in the same time. Our aim is that through regulation we'll become more innovative. Um, that would be great, but it becomes more and more difficult when you have a specific aim, which is to, you know, to regulate according to your values and where discussions are going, I think it's too early to say. Uh, we have, I think, more than 3,000 amendments or so. 
Um, they still need to be looked in depth to, to see what their goals and, and aims are. Um, but um, when the discussion intensify over the autumn and perhaps even next year, we have to be um, cautious not to lose the big picture spectrum because then you will be focusing on the amendments and not thinking what you want to achieve with this legislation. This is my worry and this is my worry that I had with other pieces of legislation uh, that we've developed here in the European Parliament. They're all part of a digital jigsaw. They all need to fit well together, um, but they all need to have an overall goal and aim. And if one tells me, yeah, well, that's to make us more innovative, Innovative. Well, there are a lot of experts, and we heard some of them today, that are warning us that perhaps that's not, not necessarily 100 percent the way um, to go uh, forward. Um, so in my committee, in, in the ITRA committee, I think we've, we've came forward with a report that is very innovation friendly, uh, particularly putting a, a strong emphasis on sandboxes across Europe. Uh, but, uh, you know, my, my issue is why are we regulating the act in the main committee, which is the Civil Liberties Committee. Uh, I believe we should be doing it from a different perspective, and, and this is the different perspective that, that the U.S. has taken. Uh, they see it from an economic lens. Uh, we see it from, and, and as I said in the opening remarks, one doesn't exclude the other. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's, there, there's a way to go forward, uh, which is not just looking at the 3,000 amendments. While looking at them, we need to say, what do we actually want to achieve? And I'll be very proud if this is the house to kind of bring up the bigger picture on AI and say it's not just about is it the machine or is it the person that produces the product to, to, to have the liability. That's a very important question. There's going to be a lot of discussion. There already are on that question. Um, but moving, once we, once we decide how we address that, then there is, you know, a bigger topic out there. Uh, five seconds. Yeah, actually, this is great because I actually like yeah, My apologies. It's really five seconds. Is yes, I believe that the balance always depends on the angle of observation. And for Uyghurs in concentration camp in China, facial recognition is 95% of, <laughs> of the story. One way of putting it. Uh, by the way, Mr. Schmidt probably called into question the title of your series, Regulation for Innovation as opposed to Regulation and Innovation. Speaking of yeah, which... Yeah. Provide, getting a, a context and, and looking at this. Um, Greg, you have worked in the AI field in the United States. You're now in a, a major think tank, a good com a collaborator with the German Marshall Fund, CSIS, and working specifically on AI and AI project and regulation. I'd like to ask you first how you look, how you, or how you think Americans in Washington look the way the EU is approaching AI regulation as a just kind of a general thing. Um, but then I'd like to go to a second thing, which is talks about a specific application. But first. Great. Uh, well, uh, thanks to MEP Maydell for the invitation to join you all today, and thanks for the terrific conference. Um, I think the most important thing, of course, is uh, something that you heard from Dr. Schmidt at the beginning, which is what does the U.S. want in all of this? We want a strong prosperous, free, and democratic Europe, uh, so much so that we're willing to spend money on it. Uh, when I was at the U.S. Department of Defense, you know, DARPA funds a great deal of AI research, and not just in the United States. European universities put in research proposals, and they win. We spend money to give it to Europeans uh, so that they can do great work in AI. When you heard Dr. Schmidt uh, state that uh, the European Union uh, is incredibly strong in artificial intelligence, that is unambiguously true, but it's true with caveats. Uh, if you look at the uh, research ecosystem, uh, many of the best papers being published by any organization are coming out of Europe. Uh, the United States, Europe, and China are all really strong in AI research. I think the real distinguishing factor is on the commercialization of that research. And that is where Europe lags behind, is not in generating research breakthroughs, but in harnessing those research breakthroughs for economic growth and prosperity. From our perspective, regulations can absolutely stifle innovation or regulations can foster innovation. But the first thing you have to understand in considering that is that the regulatory environment is not starting from scratch. 
if somebody invented uh, an incredibly powerful and potent artificial intelligence system 20 years ago and then tried to put it into a commercial aircraft, they would encounter regulation. Just because the technology is new does not mean that it is encountering an, uh, an, an open, no regulatory landscape. And so much of the U.S.'s success has been in regulatory approaches, but it's in clarifying legal uncertainty or in lowering the bars to regulation with certain stipulations. For example, um, our Department of Transportation has come up with a number of laws around the use of AI in autonomous vehicles. Why, were, why was this the case? It was because the default assumption was that it would be prohibited. Having a vehicle with no driver is not lawful, and you would incur an enormous amount of legal liability if you tried to do so. And so what was the regulation that unlocked the innovation? It was the regulation that said you can have the machine drive the car, provided you fo follow these stipulations. So it was providing the regulatory sandbox or the innovation framework that allowed certain things uh, to occur that could not occur in the prior regulatory environment. And this is the same story that is repeated with drones. Previously, it would have been prohibited to fly drones in American airspace because that airspace is controlled by the FAA and the drone that you bought, you know, at a store is not registered with the FAA. So we came up with regulations whereby as long as it's under a certain altitude, as long as it's registered to an owner, then this thing can take place. So the primary driver of innovation in the U.S regulatory framework was figuring out how to safely and responsibly allow things that previously would have been prohibited. Um, and that is a lot of our innovation. The second major difference uh, between the U.S. and the European approach, I would say, is that in general, uh, the U.S. approach to AI regulation has been very vertical in nature, which is to say it is sector specific. The Department of Transportation is responsible for thinking what AI looks like in uh, autonomous cars. Uh, the Department of the Treasury is responsible for looking at what AI might look like when it's used in making decisions about loans or mortgages or insurance payments. And so it's going sector specific. And in general, uh, these are institutions that are analyzing their existing legal authorities and coming up with new regulations to apply that to AI. Um, the difference with that and the European approach is that the AI Act would be a horizontal regulation, which is to say it is regulating the technology across many different industries, uh, regardless as to how it's taking place. Um, that could be a beneficial or that could be a detrimental approach. It depends upon the implementation of that approach. What I'll say is that um, the United States and the European Union are both starting from the same starting point, uh, which is a soft law approach, which is to say publication of guidelines, publication of best practice documents. In the United States, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies uh, is currently drafting its AI risk management framework. It would include many of the same uh, ideas that are embodied in the AI Act, uh, such as third-party audits to ensure that AI systems in safety critical industries, such as in energy or critical infrastructure, um, are developed and monitored and overseen in a way that is consistent with our uh, need for safety and reliability. Um, but now what you see is the European Union is moving from a soft law approach to a hard law approach. Um, and that could be done well or that could be done poorly. And as uh, you heard uh, MEP Maydell say, there are a thousand plus amendments that will determine what the final outcome is. So before you moved to CSIS, you were in the Department of De Defense. You were involved in the Department of Defense. As the U.S. Department of Defense, the big, kind of basically the biggest military machine in the world, tried to develop AI ethics, and not only tried to develop, they, they developed AI principles to use in warfare and, and more. And talk about a hard application, hard use case in which to, to develop principles that are used in an application that most people don't like. We certainly don't like the need for it. Uh, in fact, I think it was just earlier last week that the, that the DOD came out with an implementing strategy for that. They had also previously come out with some guidelines for companies to say to companies that are supplying products, services to the Department of Defense, 
using certain AI applications, what sort of principled guidelines does the Department of Defense, you know, think about this? When you're thinking now about the application of AI, how do you distinguish AI in civil use and AI in military use? Is there a difference in regulating? Can you apply a general regulation to, to, that, um, to these use cases? So I think what's uh, very helpful to remember here is that, again, um, even in the military sphere, we are not starting from scratch. Uh, we have international humanitarian law. We have the international law of war. In the United States, we have our legal obligations under the United States Constitution and United States uh, law. Um, and we also have, also have uh, military service-specific safety standards and military-specific um, uh, ethical codes. And that is the starting point from which we say, okay, what more than this do we want to do uh, when we're taking into account um, AI? Again, I think AI is not the first revolutionary technology that the United States military has had to uh, uh, deal with adopting. Um, and in many cases – the lessons that we have learned, hard learn, you know, hard, hard fought lessons, uh, very much apply. The United States military is extremely good at understanding the right way to deploy software. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this, uh, is in fighter aircraft. Uh, there is already a version, this was developed in the 1980s, uh, called the ground collision avoidance system, which can detect when a fighter pilot takes a turn too hard and the G-forces cause the, the pilot to black out, the computer on board, and this is before machine learning, before the modern AI revolution, the, the computer on board can detect that the pilot has uh, uh, blacked out, take control of the aircraft, fly it straight and level uh, until the pilot regains consciousness, and then turn back over control um, uh, to the pilot. This is the kind of thing that we were figuring out in the 1980s, and it was really hard uh, to do that. And we also had to come up with safety standards that said, hey, this is a software system that we're going to trust in life and death circumstances. This is a software system that we're going to trust in, con uh, in conditions in which the use of force uh, in wartime is a factor. You can bet we double, triple, octuple checked you know, every different feature of that system. What's different about uh, machine learning is that it has different failure modes. It has, you know, machine learning software compared to traditional software. Uh, you know, Deep Blue, the system that uh, Gary had to face off against, that was a rules-based system. That was a traditional software-based system. Uh, machine learning works differently, and it breaks differently. And so in the Department of Defense, we do not have nearly as mature of a capability to test and validate and verify that that system is going to work under every circumstance that it absolutely positively must work. And so in the Department of Defense, we don't deploy that AI system. Our, our, we are waiting for the techniques for it to be reliable enough and proven enough for it to be deployed to those kinds of applications. So right now, the DOD's ethical approach is walking AI up the risk ladder. You know, we are willing to deploy AI in these use cases because we can demonstrate that it will op operate with the required reliability, but we will not deploy it in those other use cases. And if I may just say one other thing, uh, because I don't want to forget, um, the Russian military has uh, weapon systems that the manufacturers claim are AI-enabled lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, these systems have been deployed to Ukraine. Now, they have a remotely piloted mode, and they have, uh, as the manufacturer claims, an autonomous mode. Uh, but it is very possible that in the next few years, we will see the first use case of an offensive machine learning-based autonomous weapon system. Uh, and what the war in Ukraine reminds us is that while the, the, you know, the U.S. has been very much focused on safety risks or the risks of accidents related to the military use of AI, um, the intentional unethical behavior is an unsolved problem in international relations. And the military of Russia has been bombing hospitals. They have been bombing nonprofit NGO organizations. Um, and so we must remember that uh, while unintentional accidents is a problem, there is also the unsolved problem of intentional unethical behavior. And unfortunately, Russia has said that. I'm so glad you said that because I do want to come back to that, that issue of how you we, we're talking about the regulating ourselves and our use, but 
will others necessarily comply with the regulations that we develop? But before I do that, I'd like to talk to, turn to you, uh, Georg. Georg Rollman, you work with Siemens Energy. In that sense, you're one of the leading companies dealing with one of the big ethical issues that we're facing. You know, energy and climate change are two things that are very much related to each other. I, your current work is with re regard to the application of AI in some of the Siemens systems. How do you figure, how do you distinguish, have you bought all the technology that, that um, uh, GraphCore can, can, can give you? Have you applied it? Do you have your internal guidelines on how to use it, or do you look to regulation law and regulation for that? And with that, how competitive are European suppliers in this field? Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Peter, for that for that question. So first of all, as, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Nigel's um, uh, uh, graph course, uh, processor. So that is really one uh, key enable. I was really happy uh, to hear. You know, speeding up uh, decision making, speeding up computations. That in the energy industry uh, will also be in future of, of key importance. You know, because uh, yeah, climate change. I mean, we are all aware uh, that this really puts us as an urgency really to develop you know sustainable, reliable, affordable energy solutions uh, for ev everybody on the planet. And at the same time, the complexity of these energy systems is really vastly increasing. Um, so, what we have in terms of applications in mind, uh, where, you'd, uh, where um, uh, you know AI methods can can greatly help, but uh, um, I, I'm fully convinced. Um, as a tool is, for example, to develop digital twins of uh, power plant components, of energy system components from the part level really up to the system level. And then, you know, with all this interconnectivity of the different parts of the energy system to really uh, in, enable better decision making in real time. So the challenges that we are facing there is especially, you know, the complexity of, of these decisions. So if you think, let's say, of any use case, let's say a physics, a physical hardware component running somewhere in an energy system, you know you have data from manufacturing that you need to take into account, you have data from operation, from thousands of sensors, you have data from testing, simulation, and so on. And to combine all these different data sets together and then utilize, let's say, the best approaches for decision making to better understand really about probabilities, about reliabilities, that is really one key challenge in the energy industry where AI can help to, you know, bring us faster uh, and also with, uh, let's say, more uh, reliability uh, to a, a decarbonized world. And one thing that, that I strongly or we strongly believe is that's nothing, you know, uh, just one company or country can do alone. But it's, you know, has to be partnering with, you know, other countries, like-minded partners across the world um, to really solve these challenges. Does the, does the regulatory framework that you operate in today, so before the AI Act, does the regulatory framework that you operate in today provide you the guidance you need in terms of using AI? Or I think that one of the questions that we, we had earlier was about do companies need that regulatory certainty in terms of how you apply AI? Yeah, I, I would think what is really important is, um, I think it was mentioned uh, before by, uh, by Eva, is the trustworthiness and, and really transparent, you know, algorithms and methodologies for decision-making. If I think, for example, um, you know, of design optimization of a certain component, yeah, you know, that probably doesn't have to be regulated because, you know, you just use a better model to produce at the end a better, a better part. But if you think of, for example, uh, autonomous operation, for example, of, you know, parts of the critical infrastructure, it's really important, you know, that uh, you understand, uh, you know, how the algorithms are operating, but also on the other hand side uh, that you can take into account all the data that's available to train your models and not just, you know, have silos of data, but really are able to, to take everything into account as good as possible because the results that you get at the end depend also on the quality of the data, sharing data, let's say data economy. So that is something that we think is really important. So you have to think not just of the AI Act, but the Data Governance that, Act, that the Data true. Act, the Get Data Governance Act, all of the, the energy space, um, all of those other things that are, that are going to be done. Um, Nigel, I wanted to come to you because you're further away for us. You've listened to a couple of different perspectives. And again, as a manufacturer, European manufacturer and a leader in, in the space of machines that do AI, 
how do you how do you react, for instance, to what Greg just said about the ethical problem of someone using the machine incorrectly? And that was also something that Mr. Kasparov said in his original comments. You've got this very powerful machine. How do you have a way to ensure that the that the function objective that's being brought into the use of the AI that's going to be used there is ethical? It's a, it's a great question. And I, and I think I would, I would go back to some of the comments that have gone on here. And I think everybody is, is broadly agreeing. Um, yeah, Isaac Asimov, in his science fiction book from the 1950s, proposed three laws for robotics. You know, first law, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. Second law, a robot must obey the orders given to it by a human, except where it conflicts with the first law. The third law, a robot must protect its own existence as long as protection does not conflict with the first or the second laws. On the face value, you know, that sounds incredibly sensible. The problem is completely impractical because robots and AI does not have independent thought. It is merely following a methodology that has been described by a human being. And so, you know, the machine itself cannot be regulated. All we can do is look at how we control the environment around which the technology is used, the applications in which it's put, how it's trained, make sure the data is not biased, you know, that the way in which we actually can control AI is a very complex and complicated field. I think, as many on the panel have highlighted, um, you know, you cannot know for certain that the answers it will produce will always be exactly the same. Just as I would give another example, when you choose a life partner, you don't necessarily have all the information to hand to know that you're making you know, absolutely the correct choice. You're driven by emotions and you're driven by you know, filling in the gaps in the information you have to try and make a leap of faith um, towards this is the right person for you to spend the rest of your life with. You can't explain your decision exactly how you make that decision. Obviously, we would not hope that a machine has that kind of emotion. We would hope that a machine is following a much more um, prescripted set of rules, a uh, prescripted set of methods that is making the decisions from, but still it will sometimes make a mistake. And so the regulation has to be focused on controlling how the application is used, controlling how well and how robust the system is. And the risk is that you try and be too prescriptive around what that regulation is, and you actually restrict the capability of the machine. One of the ways in which you make AI more robust is you increase the information capacity, the knowledge capacity that the AI system has. You make the models bigger, you make them know more. And, and the risk is that we try and say, no, no, we must have these models that are very explainable. Um, in some cases, you're gonna make the models bigger, they'll be less explainable, but they will be more accurate. They will give better results um, as a result of it. So you need to be very careful about the regulations you put in place and how those will end up limiting the potential innovation that the industry could bring to bear to actually make the technology much safer and much more reliable. Great, thank you very much. I'd actually like to, to go ahead and, and this is a great group of people to ask questions of. You, gentlemen, you were just the first to, to raise your hand. Clemens Schuster, running a Swiss uh, politics data startup on transparency and um, having open government data as a resource, so I'm pretty much doing that uh, all day long, what you've been discussing now. Um, I'm missing actually two or three uh, directions of a solution on these topics. Um, may I throw in some thoughts? My first thought would be the question of sandboxes might be tricky because who wants to be in an AI regulated sandbox, who wants to be the trial and error in that sandbox when it comes to AI? I think the explosion is maybe a little too big, even in a sandbox. Second thought, um, I'm missing 
one of the really European approaches in that topic, which could be, for example, open source and commons. When it comes to AI regulation, um, put the algorithm to the commons that everybody might have a look, check, whatever wants to do it, might use it as a resource. So don't protect the algorithm. Um, think of the value added topics, not just the data. And um, because it's pretty much the same questions which are popping around now since some weeks when it comes to the European health data space, exactly where that could be applied right now. Okay. So no patents or, 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 or IP in a sense. There was a, a, I'm sorry, a woman. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, it's Elizabeth Crossick from Relex. Hi, thank you very much. It's been an absolutely fascinating afternoon. Um, I just want to pick up, I've got a comment and a question. I want to pick up on, on the comment you made, Nigel, um, data, uh, that uh, you have to make sure data isn't biased. But much of data comes from humans. Humans are biased, ergo data is biased. So the aspiration that data is unbiased is really, I, I think it's unobtainable. And the more we talk about data not being biased, the more we assume a possibility that I think isn't real. What is important is that, unlike humans, you can correct the bias. And I think that's, you know, if a human is biased, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to correct that. You work at it, but it's not so easy. If a machine is biased, you find out where the bias is and you, and you correct it. So I think sometimes we, we, um, we have to be careful about the language because we, make, we give expectations which I think we can't achieve. That's just my observation. And we, we give an expectation to citizens which is maybe not achievable. My question, though, is on the AI Act, and we've heard from people in the Commission as well, um, the AI Act is, as drafted by the Commission, pretty targeted, right? Because it is about only looking at high-risk applications. But as you ever said, in, um, in, in the European Parliament, you've got 2,000-plus amendments. The Council is also looking, and we know that the way the EU regulation works is always a compromise. So my question to the panel is, how can we ensure that the regulation does stay narrow in scope and reach and doesn't pull in all sorts of other, part, other things which give obviously unintended consequences and creates a huge amount of costly compliance that European companies are going to have to take, take on. And as we know, the majority of European companies are actually SMEs. It might actually foreclose them from even starting to innovate here in Europe. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so. Again, be thinking of questions. I'd like to come back to you. But in the meantime, I'd actually like to, to turn the questions over to the panels. If there's anything, I mean, there seemed to be one thing that was actually positively directed at you, uh, Nigel, on the bias issue. Um, that, you know, I, but again, I'd, I'd be interested as to whether or not the bias issue is an issue for you and for, your, for, for GraphCore. Or is that an issue for the people who buy and use the, the systems you develop? The, the issue is very much for the people who buy and use um, the equipment. But I think the, buy, the, the, the comment is correct. You must assume that there may be bias in the data. Um, you must find ways in which you build a system that looks at the outcomes and ensures that the outcomes themselves are not biased. You must look at the ways in which you review the data and, and take the data before you use it as a method to train your machine to ensure that the outcomes are not biased. And, and so you must build systems around the outside you know, that, that look at that. Um, and I think AI is probably one of the few ways in which you can do that. You, certainly humans can pass the data, but AIs can pass the data. We, we for example, at GraphCore use AI in the when we recruit and put um, advertisements on our website, we use AI to ensure that we have not included any unconscious bias in the way that we describe um, those roles um, on our website. So AI can be used to remove bias you know, from uh, applications as well. Great. Kerry, you wow. want to jump in? Wow. <laughs> yeah, I have to jump in. Strongly disagree. Data cannot be biased. It's data. What is bias is our history. 
But whatever we do, any of us, we introduce our own bias. I think the data is the least biased uh, uh, application we can use for AI because it's based on our history. If we don't like this data, oh, absolutely. Gender, race, there's so many things happened in the past that affect the data. But it's like looking in the mirror saying, oh, you know, I don't like my body. Maybe I should distort the mirror. <laughs> my, my advice, start working on your body. So I think it's, just, it is, it's a very dangerous path trying to think that AI can help us to cure ills of our society. So it's this, again, if we try to correct the data, historic data, that means we bring someone else's bias. And I don't know why we should trust this bias more than the bias that exists in our history. We all know about it. I don't think there's an easy solution. But I think that starting with this, with this assumption, I think it's just, it's, 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 um, that, it's definitely opening Pandora box. Maybe just, just, just one thing to add. So uh, what, what we often face is a situation of sparse data or lacking data or incomplete data. For example, in the energy you know, industry, we have, for example, uh, let's say countable number of power plants somewhere on the world, right, where we maybe have data from or maybe don't even have. And then we need in the future, you know, methods that can cope with this, you know, sparse amount of data regarding, let's say, probabilistic approaches or, let's say, combining maybe lack of data with physics modeling, where also now we see more and more advances, you know, in the AI development to, to really combine these, uh, these approaches, let's say, with, for example, physics models. And that is something where we really maybe in future uh, need, need actually more effort also in terms of research, science, and, and education. I think that one of the questions is how people see. Our brains, our brains take in much, much more data than we're conscious of. What we're doing when we're doing training, we're only training on data points that we're conscious of. So we're missing a lot of other things that, that affect the way we perceive. But in light of that, the comment about regulatory sandbox was, was an interesting one. You can't get away from it, Ava. Uh, It was indeed very interesting because we've been kind of hearing the opposite, actually, that uh, we can strengthen the proposal from an industry perspective if we give this safe space for companies to collaborate and to test, to make trials, um, and hopefully innovate. I mean, entrepreneurs know better than myself that you can give it a try and it might not work. Um, but I think um, it's an opportunity uh, for, for companies uh, to have that option should they decide to use it and to have a more unified approach and also to help member states um, establish this sort of regulatory sandboxes. We have seen it with um, legislation when it comes to um, fintech, for example, that it has been very beneficial and it's one of our strongest sectors, speaking of innovation and sectors um, that have emerged over the past couple of years in Europe. Um, so we'll be, of course, very happy to look into other options. Uh, but we thought since the file is mainly dealt from a civil you know, liberties perspective, hopefully not only because the industry committee has exclusive competences, of course, it will make a lot of sense if we try to find ways of how to foster and to support innovation. And I think uh, this is one of the ways uh, we allocate it. But of course, I'm, I'm always open to uh, different suggestions and, and ideas should you have some. I, I took the question not to say that regulatory sandboxes are bad. It's just that if I were an AI company, I wouldn't go in that sandbox because I would be too exposed. This, That's it, what I understood yeah, as yeah. well, yeah. The other way around, um, AI scales on a much different level than uh, fintech regulation. That's why it could be critical. So the scalability is much, much greater than just standard industry, even digital standard industry. Others, others who would like to pose a question? Please. Ms. Jussi Mäkinen coming from Technology Industries Finland. Perhaps there's one point that was missing, and uh, uh, it was the uh, critical um, scrutiny about the quality of data, and then uh, the following the decision, what can be derived from that data. I think that the Commission proposal to require that they are complete and free of errors is something unimaginable. But in some use cases, actually, a low uh, quality data 
is sufficient as long as you know what, where are the limitations. Uh, thank you very much. I think we have time for, for one more question, but you, the, the gentleman uh, sitting next, uh, which one are you talking about? Yep. Perfect. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Thanks. Um, She's got better eyes than I do. <laughs> uh, Randolph Carr, uh, Head of Policy at the Munich Security Conference. Um, I wanted to touch upon something that Eric Schmidt um, brought up earlier, and I guess this question goes most to Greg, because um, it's about defense and AI and defense and security mostly. Um, we're seeing now, I think, that in the context of, of Russia, that many countries um, that we'd like to export our values and regulations when it comes to AI to um, are maybe a bit more agnostic about values than we'd we'd like to like them to be um, in an ideal world. So I think the uh, the bottom line is we need our AI to win on performance, not just as on values baked in as a unique selling point. Um, so if we accept that our values are things like transparency and, and or, or our, uh, the things that we want in our, in our AI are things like transparency, bias correction, some sort of interfacing with humans in the loop, um, how can we build that in in a way that it really enhances our AI products uh, in, in terms of their competitiveness and how do we promote innovation in that direction specifically? Uh, in the military sphere? Greg, just one, one more, one quick second, just one, one more we'll do, but be, be quick and then we'll kind of wrap things up very quickly because this is an important question that gets as well to the last, the, the very important question you posed. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Matt Brizzi. I'm attorney in the European Parliament, but also a chess candidate master. So as a chess player, I learned to, uh, to understand that for every move, there's a counter move. For every problem, most likely there's a solution. This tends to apply within the chessboard, but sometimes also outside, like in geopolitics. So my question is to uh, Mr. Gary Kasparov, is there a possibility to apply such a chess-based pragmatic approach to the situation in Ukraine to support Ukrainians, also exploiting the available AI technology and data analysis we have? And so thanks again for being here and thanks to Eva Maiden for organizing such an inspiring debate. Okay, I'm going to leave that for the la last question to be answered. Greg, you were starting to answer the question specifically from uh, on the security side of things. But, okay, and I'll come back yeah. to this. So, um, data quality. So with regards to strategic competition in technology and the sources of competitive advantage, um, I think one thing that's just uh, worth reiterating um, is the days in which uh, China cannot innovate, they can only copy, um, that was a long time ago. Uh, if you look at, for example, um, Elon Musk in his bid to acquire Twitter, uh, one of his specific things is he wants to make it more like TikTok uh, because of how impressed he is with the growth of TikTok and the uh, technology innovativeness of TikTok. If you look at uh, another large U.S. tech company, uh, Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has openly disclosed multiple times uh, that several new features uh, for various uh, meta applications, whether that's, you know, regular Facebook, uh, Instagram, et cetera, um, were ideas that he got from uh, Chinese companies. Um, he's explicitly stated that multiple times. Um, the Chinese technology giants are genuinely good. Uh, if you go to um, – uh, NeurIPS or CDPR or any of the other major AI research conferences, you will find uh, Chinese companies publishing good papers. You will find Chinese academic institutions publishing great papers. And then if you go to the uh, economic side of the equation, uh, as you heard, they are attracting many billions of dollars in venture capital investment, and they are generating many billions of dollars in uh, annual revenue and profit. Um, so – is absolutely the case, right, that if you want to be competitive in the global marketplace, um, you must have a product that is competitive. And that can be across multiple dimensions. That can be – but uh, the most important dimension, of course, is what the consumer or the customer actually wants. Um, and so it's important that the United States and our allies, uh, foremost among 
would be Europe, um, continue to lead in these areas and generate the types of innovations, generate the types of capabilities uh, that the marketplace demands. Um, and that is very much something that we are eagerly uh, seeking to cooperate uh, between the United States and the European Union on the um, uh, the trade and technology uh, partnership that we have between the United States and the European Union is really designed uh, to ensure this continued cooperation and deepen this continued cooperation. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we are coming to a pretty hard close because there's another event that's going to be coming on following this. Um, there's a, the question that you asked about data, data quality. One of the things that, that comes to my mind actually is that um, it's – in order for machines to learn, they need to fail. They need to do things wrong. They need to be able to say this is good and this is bad. So it's kind of a, it's an interesting a aspect uh, to, to that. But you can also get more discussion, I think, during the last thing, uh, during, during the reception, which will follow. I would – how short can you make it within 42 moves, uh, the response to the question? Uh, on, on very, uh, very short. So I used to play Blitz Chess. Um, yeah, it's, I wish we could apply chess rules to geopolitics or to, um, to the war in Ukraine, but dictators do not play chess. If you're looking for analog, they rather play poker. So, and, uh, and I think it's just, you know, that's what Putin has been doing all the time by bluffing. So what is to be done now is to call his bluff. Uh, so, and again, and I wish, you know, there's this, 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 this chess experience from my career and others that could be, could be helpful, but unfortunately, it's, um, it's, it's the game where we want to play by the rules. Actually, it's about rules and regulations. But the, our, our adversaries, they basically use this to their advantage because they violate the rules at any time. They bend the rules when they, they, see, they see its fit. Which is exactly the point that Greg made. If we can make the greatest regulation in the world, but if our adversaries don't obey, uh, go by our regulation and our ethics, where are we then? Um, Eva, I want to thank you and your team for bringing everyone here together. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, obviously, Mr. Kasparov, Mr. Tuno sitting over there and the other part of the other side of uh, the channel, and everyone who's been here. But I'm going to turn it over to you to close. And thank you. I would just join you into thanking all the speakers and panelists and all of you for making it here today. I hope it was a meaningful discussion. It will not stop here. It will continue. Uh, but first, uh, we could all join uh, the little cocktail reception uh, we have uh, together with our panelists uh, and continue the dialogue today. Many thanks to Peter for agreeing to leave the Brussels Forum uh, earlier and join us today and for your excellent moderation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.